what do they cook in this seven-story vat? How does a thick paste help start automobile engines? What's the purpose of a train that requires no tracks? Who's doing something to increase the catch of young fishermen? Industry on Parade. A brand new look at our America. Produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Bauxite Fields of Arkansas. And there go a few thousand tons of the clay-like ore from which we get aluminum. These are the only major bauxite deposits in all of the United States and Canada. And while our aluminum companies have developed sources of supply in other parts of the world, these deposits here at home remain vitally important to the continued availability of a metal now essential in hundreds of ways to national defense and the peacetime economy. As the ore is cleaned out of an area, right in behind the trucks and power shovels come horticulturists and landscape experts hired by the Aluminum Company of America to obliterate the gaping pits, replacing them with lakes and wooded hills that create greater beauty than existed before mining operations began. While mining bauxite is comparatively simple, the job of wringing out of it the aluminum it contains is vastly complex, requiring tools and techniques not even known until a few decades ago. Lack of these tools and techniques kept aluminum from human use during many centuries in which other metals were being widely utilized. After being crushed, washed, and dried, the powdered ore will be mixed with a hot solution of caustic soda, which causes its chemical structure to change. Then, after waste solids are filtered out, the solution is pumped into this seven-story precipitator. With most metals, the ore is reduced to a molten state and then refined of its impurities. With aluminum, the ore must be purified first and then reduced. As the tank full of liquor is agitated by compressed air, another chemical change takes place and we move one step further toward our goal. After precipitation, the caustic soda is drawn off and the solids left behind, after being thickened and dried, come out at last as a white powder called alumina. This is the purified ore from which only oxygen must be removed to produce aluminum. The alumina goes right into railroad cars for transportation to Alcoa and other companies' plants all over the nation, where the final step will be taken and the resultant aluminum will be fabricated into the thousands of useful articles now made of this strong, light, stable metal. Just part of the story of how our aluminum industry brings us a metal unknown a century ago and now being produced at the rate of hundreds of thousands of tons a year. In homes, on farms, in planes, ships, automobiles, throughout industry, anywhere you turn these days, you'll find articles of aluminum. Even modern office buildings are clad with the metal that's become indispensable. Since the founding of this nation, Americans have practiced a system of free, individual, competitive enterprise. Our belief in private capitalism, as we practice it in America, has produced more goods for more people than any other economic system known to man. Unlike the communist slave system, under our form of capitalism, we continue to keep the strength, security, and living standards of all the people on a constantly rising scale. All of us, in the home, in the factory, and on the farm, have benefited by America's system of freedom and opportunity. Millions of miles of American highway, millions of miles of cars, in every car, a battery, the source of power that puts the power of the engine into operation. Here's one of the plants from which those millions of batteries come, Gould National Battery Company of St. Paul, Minnesota. Let's see something of how a battery is made. The job begins with the casting of the lead grids that are the heart of any battery. Thickness of the grids is very important, and any that aren't just right will be rejected. 
Also very important is a coating the grid will be given, a coating of what plant workers call paste, but which is actually a carefully controlled combination of chemicals whose preparation is one of the most critical operations in the making of a battery. It's this coating on the grids, here being applied, that allows a battery to hold its charge for prolonged periods. Out they come, pair after pair. To make sure the coating is the right thickness, frequent samples are picked out to be weighed as the grids move along toward a drying oven. The double grids are separated into units by a man who also inspects them. Meanwhile, other parts of the battery are being fabricated, things like the straps and connectors, which will tie all the grids together and cause them to function in unison or as a battery of cells, from which comes the name. The grids are grouped so that there's a positive plate, then a negative, another positive, and so on. Each plate is welded to the strap on this device, a tremendous time saver compared with the tedious methods formerly used, one factor that's helped bring about great improvements in recent years, not to mention holding prices down, even in the face of constantly rising costs of labor and materials. Another big development in recent years has been the addition of fiber glass mats between the plates. Together with separators, they further minimize the danger of short circuits and vastly prolong the life of the battery. The insulated groups go into the containers which, unlike the working parts of the battery, look pretty much like they did 20 or 30 years ago. Looks can be deceiving though, for even here there have been important changes. For example, the way the covers are sealed on. The connectors and terminals are sealed with molten lead. Then the batteries are ready to be filled automatically by a pump that not only puts in just the right amount of acid, but can even detect cracked or leaky cases or covers. And now, the batteries will be charged for the first time. A series of tests are run on each battery, including a breakdown test that puts on a tremendous load for a few seconds, long enough to reveal any defects. And finally, after the acid's been changed and more tests are run, the battery is ready to be shipped. Its appearance may not have changed much, but in action out on the highway, you will find the battery of today has improved even more drastically than has the modern car over the models of a generation ago. R.G. Letourneau, Incorporated of Longview, Texas. Though long established as a maker of earth-moving equipment, the firm constantly branches out to answer challenges in other fields, like building construction. Their latest radical development is in the field of transportation, a trackless train for use in areas where putting down rails would be too difficult or expensive. South American jungles, for example, or African deserts. The train's easier to drive than an automobile. Every wheel has its own electric motor for power, and each car automatically follows in the tracks of the one ahead, whether the train is going forward or backward. It's expected that the trackless train will provide service in remote parts of the world that up to now have had no transport facilities at all. If a bulldozer can go through to open a rough trail, the trackless train can follow. Because of its height, width, length, and weight, it's not likely to bring competition to established rail and highway facilities, but out where the road ends, or no real road has ever existed, that's where we soon might be hearing about an almost entirely new form of overland transport. The remaining frontiers in desert and jungle, just two more of the challenges that industrialists like to meet head on. There is hardly a day passes that you don't see or read about some new medicine, gadget, machine, or a new comfort on the market. 
To do this each year, industry sets aside from its earnings more than $1 billion for research to discover new products or improve those already being made. This research is working for you because these new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us. In addition, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater opportunity for better living for everybody. Remember this? No, it isn't the recreation of a scene from the early years of the century. A good many youngsters still fish this way. That is, they call it fishing, although despite the romantic legends to the contrary, you don't really pull in many big ones with a safety pin. More likely, you go home like this, empty-handed. All of which is a matter of concern to a company that hopes to have these boys for customers in years to come. The firm is Wright & McGill of Denver, manufacturers of fishing supplies and equipment. They make every imaginable sort of device here to lure, catch, recover, and otherwise outwit the poor fish. Some of their products are way out of the price range of the young fishermen we saw earlier, but much of the company's output is not too expensive even for a boy. Among the first acquisitions recommended for the young angler is at least one real hook with a barbed point to hold the bait on, and the fish too. A hook made of strong steel wire that won't open under the weight of a three or four pounder the way a safety pin does. To persuade the younger generation of the pleasures of fishing with good equipment before they give up in disgust and forget about angling for the rest of their lives, Wright and McGill each year sponsors a fishing school. The College of Angling Knowledge is run by old-time fisherman Jim Haywood. His idea is not to sell the children anything, but to help them toward a lifetime of satisfying recreation enjoyed by thousands of older fishermen like himself who got off to the right start in the first place. It isn't long before the lads learn how to extend the range of their fishing by casting their bait many yards in any direction. New equipment helps combat backlash and snarled lines, the two big boogaboos of the caster, but proper wrist motion is still very important. Hey, look at this. And look at this, our two friends back in business with fishing gear they won as prizes given to the outstanding students of the fishing school. It makes a difference, doesn't it? This trout isn't the only one who's caught, for where fishing is concerned, these two lads are hooked for life. 